So the objective is today to share my research-based information about the skills need, needed by these students, by our students, to thrive in a global economy, and to discuss strategies for creating learning experiences and a learning environment in our classrooms. Uh, so that is why um, I compiled this workshop, and I'm going to be asking you to par participate as we go along. What are 21st century skills, from your own sense of, of the uh, term? What do you consider 21st century skills? Any ideas, just without looking at the, at the handout? Using a computer. Using a computer, technology, OK. Social media, media. yeah. Being able to work effectively with people from other cultures. Ah, being able to work effectively with people from other cultures. All right. Good. They're all good, and I was going to record them on the board. I think that will we'll just, if you could uh, make sure that you're taking the notes too. Uh, I started looking into all the different kinds of skills, and there were lists and lists that I found. But I found one particularly good article in the book that I was teaching from for my 1101 class. 1101 is the writing class that uh, the, that some first semester freshmen start out with. And this was a reader, and it was an article in the reader that students were supposed to be assigned. So I was looking at it, and I'm going, this is a great idea for students themselves to be aware of the kinds of skills that are supposed to prepare them for various jobs in the 21st century. The problem was that it was a little bit too advanced for my students. So I took a long time assigning it to them and asking them to, to look at it, to dissect it, take it apart, and really understand what it was asking of them and whether or not they thought they had these skills. And it was a great success in my classroom. Uh, the four basic skills and the way that it was phrased in this particular article by Claudia Wallace and Sonia Steptoe are, first of all, knowing more about the world, all right, thinking outside the box, uh, an idiom, uh, becoming smarter about new sources of information, so not just the technological skills and the science skills and the math skills that we all need, but how, with all the deluge of information out there, how do our students know what's reliable and what's not? And then developing good people skills, all right? So we're going to take each one of those one at a time and look at them in the way that I ask my students to look at them as well. The first one is knowing more about the world. And okay, they quote uh, the then CEO of UPS, and who is now currently on the board of 3M and IBM, who stated that he was looking for workers or employees who were adaptable to, and sensitive to foreign cultures and who had foreign language skills. Mm -hmm. So how many of you have uh, taken a foreign language in, in high school? All right, everybody. How about in college? All right, back when I took, when I went to high school, it was, it was assumed that everybody had a foreign language. That was back in 1960s. I'm going to be 65 in, in a month. And so I just assumed that that was the way everybody was educated. And my daughters are now in their 30s. So again, they, they took foreign language skills. But I had no idea, um, you can go to the next slide, that overall enrollment in foreign language courses, and this is a statistic from 2015, are down for the first time since 1995. And that it has be, it been going down or decreasing since 2009. This is from MLA, and I'm thinking to myself, why is this happening? Because that is the way I learned about the world. I had four years of Spanish, Mr. Sineski, a Polish Spanish teacher, okay? <laughs> and he was great. I didn't learn how to speak Spanish, but I learned how to read it, and I learned how to understand it. I can still, when I hear a Spanish conversation anywhere, I can still understand it. And then when I, I got my PhD, it was um, required. You had to be able to read a, um, a college level document, an article, in a foreign language and translate it, you know, and that's in, into English. And, and I did it, and it was easy for me simply because I had such great training. Uh, the data from um, 2012 also was pointing to this. Um, 
what I didn't realize was that eight out of 10 Americans speak only English. And you'd think that that was no big deal, all right? That, um, because everybody in the world speaks English, right? Not so. This is a, uh, a map that I found. And if you look at it, everybody in the world doesn't speak English. The English speakers are in dark green. Everybody else never heard English. So if we're thinking in terms of preparing our students to be able to adapt to the world, which is incredibly shrinking, uh, we're doing business all over the world. Our, our students need to know how to communicate, and not only how to communicate, but how, how to uh, be sensitive to other cultures. This is the problem. One reason for the reduction in, enroll, in enrollment, according to one of our Florida teachers, who is the uh, chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, is that our students are under increasing pressure to go to college so that they can get a high paying job upon graduation. And what Jillian Lort goes on to say is that what used to be the underlying assumptions behind the goal uh, to get a good job, which used to be strength in the liberal arts, uh, broad disciplines and critical thinking seems to have fallen by the wayside in recent years. If you look at when the foreign language <laughs> departments stopped insisting on students taking foreign languages started in 2009 and that is when the economic crisis began. All right. In your opinion, why do you think uh, fewer students are interested in global are in, interested in foreign language and are less globally aware. What do you think? Have you seen this in your classrooms? Yeah. Okay. You pardon? It's I teach Spanish here. You teach Spanish here. Okay. What's happening? I don't know. I, it's uh, one question that I ask myself, you know, because uh, I tell my students uh, um, in this 21st century if you are bilingual, um, course the doors are the doors are open for you everywhere especially Spanish speakers yes um, I remember that um, a per census 2009 50.5 million people here in America they, they are speaking Spanish so probably right now 2015 is more than mm. 50, 50 million people any other ideas about what's happening? I would say so this would be one reason, maybe not the, uh, the most significant, is the funding in the, at the high school okay. level. And with the state testing, and having to uh, finance right. state testing, and then bring in reading teachers. So you have more reading teachers, and so who suffers? Yeah. Foreign language, music, uh, you know. The arts. Yeah, the yeah. electives. The arts. Yes. And yeah. I think uh, one thing it's uh, very important, because I, it's my subject, that. Um, sometimes, and not uh, all, the, all of them, but I think uh, the, the high school professor and uh, teaching uh, foreign language, they only speak the target language that they are uh, teaching. Right. So they, they, they go to Spanish class uh, in high school and they speak English in class. And when they come to college and uh, we speak all the time in Spanish at the beginning of the semester so probably they are afraid to to listen mm. uh, Spanish because they are not familiar with the language since, since, yeah. since high school. But isn't that where you get the culture? Because I learned all about Latin America, uh, all about Central America, yeah. all about Spain, all about the other Spanish-speaking countries in the world, and that's how I understood what other countries were yeah. about, uh, their their traditions. Me. Yeah. Me. When I was in Colombia, I am from Colombia, South America, and, uh, and I remember that I, and I always tell my students, when I was in uh, seven, eight, nine, ten grade, I learned about geography, history from yes. the United States, from Europe, from Asia, from Australia. And, and sometimes I ask my students, you know, when I teach them the years, uh, and I ask them, um, I'm going to give you points, extra points, if you can tell me in Spanish, um, that with the year and the month of the uh, United States independence, and most of them, they don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, 
So our students, it, and it's affecting more than just our students, and that's, yeah. that's the thing that's happening. And this may be alarming or an alarmist type of report, but the United States, and this is something from the Independent Task Force reported uh, to the U.S. Education Reform and National Security Council, the United States' failure to educate its students about global issues leaves them un unprepared to compete and threatens the country's ability to thrive in a global economy and maintain its leadership role, um, according to this Council on Foreign Relations. In fact, it says that if students or if our workforce is not going to be able to compete and uh, relate with uh, the global economy and be sensitive in global issues, then what's going to be happening is that we're not going to be as, as knowledgeable um, in foreign relations, and that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, you are seeing it in politics. We're seeing it right now. How can we incorporate global issues and sensitivity into our classroom? Okay. Uh, there was a study done back in 1998 at Johns Hopkins University, and I really liked what I saw in this, even though it's dated and it was for um, basically um, uh, K through 12. It wasn't, it wasn't for the college classroom, and yet I have um, incorporated it into my writing classes, and I'll tell you how. Introduce the idea to students that global issues and challenges exist and they, uh, that they affect students' lives. So how do I do that in a, in a writing class? And I'm not sure what you're teaching, but the way that I did it was I started um, assigning books about people in other countries. And the first one was Escape from Camp 14, which is about a North Korean student, or not a student, um, he was born in a prison camp. And he was born in 1982, so some of these, he's just maybe 10, 8 to 10 years older than some of the students sitting in the, in the uh, seats in my classroom. Um, it, it talks about the way that he was raised without love, that, that he, he had, he, um, he was forced to eat rats because he didn't have enough food. Um, and when he finally escaped, how, how ill-prepared he was for, um, the kinds of things that he had to see in a civilized world. And as they begin to understand what it's like in North Korea, they begin to know who's pulling the strings in North Korea, Russia and China. And they begin to understand about the, the global affairs. And then they see how it affects them. And as news begins to break out about North Korea, they're on that right away. Did you read about this? Did you see that? And those are some of the ways that we can start incorporating those ideas into the classroom. Uh, it's a good idea if you're going to start using this kind of material, and if it's possible, to study at least one global issue in depth and over time. Understand that global issues and challenges are interrelated, complex, and changing. In other words, what you understood about that country a month ago, it's going to change. Mm -hmm. Be aware that the information and knowledge on most global issues are incomplete and they need to keep seeking information. In other words, get the idea across that just because you know this about North Korea, you don't know everything about North Korea. And those are the kinds of things that they suggested on an elementary level. So I thought, is it going to work? It, it was so fascinating to see how students engaged and how they began to understand and appreciate their own democracy after, after learning about this secretive uh, country that, you know, that was right, right in their universe that they didn't even know about. Okay. Uh, another thing that's coming up, and I'm not sure if you are aware of it, but we have an author series in, um, in the college. And the book that they are featuring this year is called The Bosnia List. Now this is something that I am not aware of at all, but I've been reading it over the summer and I've been doing a lot of investigating. It is about uh, the Bosnian War that took place 20 years ago. It's written by Kenan Trebenchevic, sorry if I didn't, I didn't pronounce that, but our author series um, coordinators are Heidi Marshall and Rosalind Francis and uh, it's one way to introduce your students to this other culture 
Um, it, will, it, it is the former Yugoslavia. I didn't know that. And the countries that then split from Yugoslavia since then um, will, uh, one of the countries was, of course, Bosnia. It tells this terrible story about a young man who is now coming to speak at our, our college in the spring who will um, elaborate on how he had to hide for two years in his apartment before he was able to escape this war simply because he was a Muslim. Mm. So it puts a whole different take on how we view Muslims in this country. Um, it is another way of getting the idea of global issues to the forefront of um, the skill set that our students need. And one of the things I want to say about and why I'm putting more emphasis on global awareness is because all of the other things, all of the other four skills that we're talking about today follow global awareness. Once you are invested in learning about um, another country in this particular way, you develop the skills of information literacy. You develop the skills of compassion, people skills for other cultures. Um, and you learn how to think out of the box, outside of the box, because you are, you are finally understanding that every, everybody's life isn't exactly like yours. And so you start to see things differently. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I started my one skill to start working on in my classroom was the, um, the global um, awareness part of the skill sets that we're talking about. Okay, the next skill, how am I doing? Thinking outside of the box. Mark Tucker, president and CEO of the National Center on Education and the Economy, Economy believes that all jobs in the 21st century will put an enormous premium on creative and innovative skills, seeing patterns where other, others just see chaos. Okay, and that was in the Wallace and Steptoe article that I taught my students. But how many of you have ever heard of Sir Ken Robinson? Oh, OK. All right, so I'm going to do, instead of actually showing you a clip from his, some of his um, famous YouTube videos, I'm going to show, tell you what he has to say about education. And I have two of his books up here that um, we can talk about after the, uh, the workshop. Yet our education is still modeled on the 19th century, all right? Uh, it was built on industrialism. It's, it operates according to a factory-like structure. C children continue to be educated in batches, as he says, not as individuals. And they have few opportunities for choice or deviation. All right, you've got that little, you know, they come out like little robots. They're all the same. We have a great big classroom of 40 students or 30 students, and they all teach, are taught in basically the same way. Um, they're told. Um, you know, the answer's in the back of the book, and they, they're given multiple choice questions, and there's only one answer. It's only the one correct answer. There's no deviation. No wonder why creativity and innovation is stifled by its very process. Let's look at the way Ken Robinson would think about creativity and divergent thinking. He says that creativity exists and can be cultivated in any classroom and in any uh, subject matter. It is the process of having original ideas that have value. And I have that in my office at home and in my office um, at school. And I'm going to put it in my classroom, in my classrooms at school. Because I want to think about it, and I want my students now to think about it. But I'm not necessarily sure about how to actually help students to, to arrive at their creative process. So maybe you can help me with this. Divergent thinking, this is another, I'm not actually diverting from the topic when I, when I introduce this, but it's an essential capacity for creativity, according to Robinson. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, to think laterally, not just linear or convergent ways, to see multiple answers, not just one. And that comes from the YouTube um, Changing Education Paradigms. I will encourage you to watch that YouTube and bring it into your classrooms. It's 11 minutes and have students watch it as well. Okay. Now, 
he bases, um, or he, he goes to the end of this YouTube video and he wants to, his uh, viewers to understand what he's talking about with divergent thinking and how this ties in with creativity and education. There was a study by Landon Jarman back in 1998 and the authors did this over time. They took, I'm not sure whether it was 1,500 or 1,600 students, children, and they asked them, they did them, a, they gave them tests on longitude, I mean on di divergent thinking rather. And an example of one of these tests might be, how many uses can you find for a paperclip? And a normal person might come up with 15 or 20. Um, a genius level would come up with between 100 or 200 because they would say something like, well, can it be made of foam rubber, rubber and can it be six feet tall? Okay? So I'm going to ask you, let's do the first one. What, yeah, that's it. What percentage scored at genius level between the ages, when the, when the children were eight, ages three to five years old? What percentage do you think? Yeah, high. What do you think? 98%. 98%. They went back five years later. What percentage okay, scored at genius level at the ages 8 to 10 years old? 80. Okay. Let's see. 32%. Five years later, 13 to 15. Okay. 10%. What happened? What happened to them? They were educated. And this is, he has another, it, it's the most watched TED Talk in history uh, called Do, the, Are Schools Killing Creativity? Okay? Uh, you, you need to watch that one too. Um, although the 11 minute one is animated and it's much more um, entertaining. But yes, what has happened to these children? All of them have been educated. So what do we do? How do we encourage creativity and divergent thinking in our schools? Okay. This is from the Partnership for 21st Century Learning. Encourage students to use a wide variety of creation techniques when they work, such as brainstorming and Socratic questions. Now these, I have to admit to you, I haven't used myself, all right? So this is new territory for me. As I said, the one skill that I've incorporated into my classroom is the skill of global awareness. Refine, analyze, and help them to refine, analyze, and evaluate their own ideas. And I think that's the hardest part because once a student comes up with an idea, they're very, very reluctant to change because they're afraid of failure. They're also afraid of voicing that idea to begin with because they're afraid of failure. Communicate new ideas to others effectively. So they find that when students share ideas with others and they get encouraged by others with those ideas, they become more creative. Be open and responsive to new and diverse perspectives. Well, that comes with uh, the global um, awareness as well. When you start to understand what other people are thinking and that it's different and that it's okay, then you start to be more creative. You start to get original ideas. You start to develop the process of having original ideas that have value. That's the uh, definition. Help them to incorporate group feedback into their work. Understand that it's okay to listen to what other people have to say about your work and then incorporate it. It's not cheating, that's collaboration, and that's good. Learn to, do, to view failure as an opportunity to learn. Wow. And, and the system just doesn't reward that. And the last one, I think this is the biggest eye opener for me. Understand that creativity and innovation is a long-term cyclical process of small successes and frequent mistakes. So I really want to go back. This, this um, website is also something that is new to me. It's called Partnership for 21st Century Learning. And it, is, it does deal, again, with K through 12, but lots of great ideas there uh, that I think we can start um, implementing into our own classrooms. Mm -hmm. OK. Next. 
Becoming smarter about new sources of information. I'm going to go um, fairly quickly through this because what it is is helping our students understand that just because there's a flood of information out there, you don't take the easiest route. You have to understand how to be discerning. And to me, more than ever, students need to understand why patch writing, taking whatever quotes you think might be good for the teacher to see to prove that you read it and putting it in the paper is wrong. Somehow they have to understand that it's not just wrong for plagiarism purposes. Using Wikipedia, the easy way out, that's wrong. They need to understand that they're, they're losing the ability to be able to, to think and to, and to be discerning um, students of information when they, when they are adults. So I copied this uh, from the ALA website, and you can uh, do all three of those, yep. Information literacy is a set of abilities requiring individuals to recognize when information is needed and then have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use that needed information. It's a key component to lifelong learning. And it helps with self-directed investigations as individuals move into internships, professional positions, and have increasing responsibilities in all arenas of life. All right, how can we help students become smarter about new sources of information? So this comes from that um, Partnership for 21st Century Skills. But I have a better one, and I'm so glad um, to be able to point it out to you. Do you, if you need to just jot this down, it is in your notes, but if you would go to the next slide. We have a new tutorial, okay, in our uh, ProQuest, it's, it's part of our, learn, our um, it's, part, it's in the library uh, section of the database. You need to go into Artemis, click the College tab, go to the Learning, Library Learning Commons, Click databases and look for research companion. Now this is a self-directed database that students can go to in order to learn how to be good discerners of information, to be good, um, to actually know how to do a research paper, but also know how to find information, evaluate it, and use it. It's there. You can use it in your own classroom and demonstrate students how to do it but they can do it themselves. Do you want to say something about it, Tom? I was just going to say, I didn't know you were doing this, but I, I want to come up and kiss you right now. <laughs> I'm so happy. It's, yeah. a, it's uh, a great and, tool. And the students really love it. And uh, this, we tested out this semester, and the demonstration shows that there was a 35% improvement in, in, in learning. So wow. it's, it's documented. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I will also say I used it in my summer class and I asked the students to give me feedback on what they felt and they really liked it. Right. And they, they felt like they learned stuff and they felt like they took a lot better. So we getting good student feedback. Right. But the same, actually what I asked them downstairs when I came in the door is I, you know, students who don't even realize that this patchwork thing is a problem. Mm -hmm. That's uh, so, right. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. All right. You can go on to the next one. Okay, and here's another stu student tool uh, for evaluating websites, and you can go to the University of Maryland, and there's a, there's a, um, a, a sheet that uh, students can print out, or you can print out for them, uh, and it's, a, uh, it's another evaluation tool. Uh, who's the author? What qualifications does the author have, et cetera? to help students get to understand um, what we're looking for when we're, we're asking them to be um, discerning. I like the idea of purpose, and I've done, done something like this before, but I really think that um, our FSCJ website is the way to go. <laughs>
and it's right there. <laughs> and all of this is um, with the handout. It's, it's all, um, there's, there's a list of references outside, I mean, on the back of um, the handout I gave you. Okay, now, the last one that Steptoe and Wallace talk about are good people skills. What they happen to, to talk about are things like um, uh, high school students knowing how to shake hands when they get their diploma. And um, I find that it goes so much deeper than that. Um, I find that, that embarrassing situations occur in the classroom when students don't understand that there are other students in the classroom who don't think the way that they do and that, that sometimes these situations arise where um, I'm not sure how to, how to handle it because it, it, there's, there's unintended rudeness, there's different kinds of things. What is your experience with students' people skills? I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> Some find it necessary to use four-letter words in the classroom to show how smart they are. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. What, what, do we, what do you do? How do you handle these things? And then my, my personality is non-confrontational. And I know that I have to get over that. OK? <laughs> there, when I, 20 years. <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> this contract for classroom behavior is one of the things um, that we're going to be talking about. Uh, maybe we can just go, um, go to the next. Just, how do we teach it? Well, I think one of the ways to teach it is uh, to assign teamwork or uh, cooperative learning groups um, where we put students in groups and we tell them what's expected of them. That's one of the ways to do it. I've also been looking at um, strategies for the first week of school online where um, you, can, you can put out that behavior expectation right in the very beginning, in the first week. Uh, but this, I thought, was, was good, where you're asking students to demonstrate the ability, or you're expecting them to demonstrate the ability to work effectively and respectfully with diverse teams. Uh, that you're, you're telling them ahead of time what you're going to expect of them, where you're delineating this is wrong, this is right. You're giving them examples, concrete examples, where you're asking them to exercise flexibility and willingness to be helpful in making necessary compromises, where you're defining what compromise means, what you're asking, uh, you're asking them to, to uh, look at a common goal and sacrifice their own priorities sometimes in order to, to meet that goal where you're asking them to assume shared responsibility for collaborative work. Now, that's the thing that I find the most difficult. And it has to do with grading. If you're, if you're going to be grading a group project and students say, oh, but this person is going to bring my grade down, you, this, this is a prime like, situation to talk about assuming shared responsibility. Um, I don't know that it always works, and that is why this is one that I'd like to work on in my classroom. Um, talking about what, I, I, the last presenter in this classroom was talking about real life skills and helping to develop the kinds of um, situations that they might be in in the future in order for them to understand what would happen if they were at a, a business and they didn't collaborate or whatever. But that, this is something, again, that I'm kind of putting out to you. This is a workshop. It is a work in progress. How do we teach people skills to our students? We, we certainly emulate them in our own conflict resolution. But how do we do that? And the last part, I think, um, that I, I put on there was the classroom contract. So I gave you some of that. And some of it was. Class begins promptly at the beginning of the class period. You should be in your seat and ready to start participating, and so should I. And the thing that I liked about the, the contract, even though it's, it's a little bit negative for my taste in some parts, I don't like to start a classroom with a negative tone. Mm -hmm. And yet, I also think that uh, 
But by putting the teacher in the same position, I'm going to do the same thing. I think that that helps in some ways. Um, so I thought that some of these, did anybody ever use this? A class contract? I've heard about people here at, you have, okay. Um, I, I'm a dead ed teacher, and okay. so I get them fresh off the street. And so what we do is we do a lot of training on how to be a student. What does it look like? How does it feel? What do we do? Can you share that with us? I'd really like it if you could just like email it to me. Yeah, I mean, it's just very simple. I mean, it's nothing like that. It's just, it, it's just being, for instance, that we do, you know, finals like, like everybody else. And attendance is a real problem, not attendance, but, but being on time. Yeah. Punctuality is a real issue. And it's not fair to the class if that door is going click, click, and then I have to walk over and go, you know, that is destructive. Mm. I mean, it's, 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 it's distracting to the other students. Yeah. So I, I, so I tell them right out front, I said, you know, I understand transportation is an issue. I understand getting away from work sometimes is an issue. I really do, and, and I do. Mm -hmm. However, to honor everyone else in our class for our final, mm -hmm. I said, if, if you are late, that door is going to be locked. I will swipe it, and I will have your final down in the assessment center. So all you have to do is go down to the assessment center and tell them that you're in Ms. Webster's class, and it's there. Ah. But that's a biggie. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a biggie for us. Mm. I was going through a set of rules like this. I didn't have a rent for going through the first class. And one of them I came to was cell phones in the classroom because of the mm -hmm. ringing and so on. Guess who's cell phone right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also. yeah. I've done that too. I know, especially when my daughter was having her baby. It was like I had to announce it before the class. I have to I have to break the rules today because she's in labor late ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I think that's okay if if you know there are exceptions. And and so and I do that also, a, a disclaimer. But there you know, and if students say, you know, Miss Webster, so and so I say, absolutely not a problem, just leave. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it's, and that's, that, that is but, people that skills. That is, that's Honoring a people skill. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, I am at the end. And the last um, slide that I have for you is um, any ideas? How will you create a learning experience or envir environment that fosters the development of uh, one skill? Anything happen today during this last hour or so that? Um, Gives you any ideas? Okay. Good. What's that? <laughs> yeah, you, and actually, that's the way I'm starting to feel about this one, too. The wonderful thing about if you do join this learning community is they will provide you with lots and lots and lots of materials you can use. Right. You can, it's up to you. You don't have to use them, but you can use them. They'll give you discussion questions, they'll give you quiz questions. If They'll provide a list of library resources. There will be activities you can send your students to. Exactly. Extra credit for. And in the spring, likely the author will be the Yes, students. in March. And, and that's not as helpful for the fall, but if you do have students get really into it, you can get them even more excited because they can come to the they author. Can, and in the spring, they love it because they, they, they stand in line for an hour just to get his autograph because then they have an autographed copy from, you know, from the author. Um, and the so thing about it, book too. So just since I put their name up there's their names up there. Awesome. Right. Awesome. And I would definitely I mean you if you contact me, I'll definitely be able to get it for you. Um, it's it it's dense in the beginning and if but if you have any problems getting into it and into the history of it and you don't have the time to do the research, let me know because I've already started with um, videos and all kinds of other stuff that I can send you. And I know that Heidi and um, Roslyn have all, as well. And I think that the library is right in on it with, with you guys, uh, with us.
Which one is it? The Bosnian list. The Bosnian list. Yeah, and if you ever wanted to do Escape from Camp 14, oh man, do I have, I have so much that I could, I could offer you on that, which is a little bit easier to, um, to teach, I mean, to read, a lot more graphic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it oh, starts out with like an ex. Well, it, like yeah. Yeah. it starts out with an execution. They'd all read that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, some some um, students do, but I always explain why I'm doing it in the beginning. That that I really believe that these skills are important, and when they start to understand what this does to open their mind, we get into the the map. We look at where this is on the map, and well, why is it that Russia and China want to help them so badly? Well, they're it's they're bordering countries, you know. I didn't know that when I first started. I didn't know any of this. I was just as, as sheltered and, and uh, unaware of what was going on. And it's terrible. It doesn't get the same kind of sympathy. Those people, even the people who aren't in the prison camps, and there are 200,000 prison camps, um, even the, the regular citizens who are not poor, part of the core class are, are starving and uh, unable to move from city to city without government permission not able to leave the country at all. So, okay. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much.